Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Driving along Pennsylvania roads during the spring, one can find many a varied site of visual interest. These sites may include remnants of canals, railroads, farmhouses, forts, and may also include an extensive set of menu items for a roadkill cafe. But today, we're going to visit a single stone which marks the location of the 1800s crime of the century the Brown family murders. See you in a minute. Hey everybody. Just wanted to let you know that the contents of this particular video might be a little bit rough to handle. I myself uh, started off with a, an emotion that grew worse to a point where I've cried while trying to tell this story several times. Um, at the same time, uh, when you watch this video, please remember all of my information is obtained from the county archives, national archives, historical societies that can prov provide factual information, not preserve, but provide um and as well as library of congress genealogy sites etc uh, so if you've heard a different story or you think you know a different story or if your grandfather's grandfather's uncle's brother's cousin decided that this is a story they told you and it differs from the story i tell you here i appreciate that but i don't want to hear about it here you can leave a comment but don't be a hater Please don't be a hater. My information is validated and factual based on what has been recorded in history. Let's continue with the video. Welcome back. The year was 1840 and the Brown family farm was diligently being planted to make the early May deadline of getting your seeds into the ground to make yield. As a side note, Pennsylvanian farmers need to get their corn seeded before the 10th of May or they will run into a loss of one and one half bushels per acre per day that their seed is not in the ground. Why is this information important to the story? Well, the Brown family farm was not just a local family farm for survival, but it was a property of 120 acres on viable farming land on the southeast slope of Jacks Mountain. Although not what one today would consider to be a massive farm, in 1840, 
At this location, the property may as well have been a full-blown regal plantation in its value. William Brown, a War of 1812 veteran, was a highly respected farmer by the local mountaineers, a group of truly rugged men who carved paths through all of the Pennsylvania Allegheny Mountain Range. He was known as the best marksman in the valley and well known for his accuracy in hunting. He was also known to not take kindly to those who would trespass against him or his neighbors, and was a man who used words of dire consequence to those who decided to try his patience. The family of William Brown lived in a cabin on the farm. In this homestead lived William Brown the father, his wife Rosanna Lawton Brown, age 51, daughter Elizabeth or Betsy, age 17, and three of his sons, George, age 16, Jacob, who was 14, and David, age 10. William Brown had an eldest son, John, who was 21 and resided four miles down the road at a farm in Shirleysburg. He also had another daughter, Margaret, who was 22 and married to one of the farmhands, Robert McConaughey. In the stories, there is tell of another sister to Margaret whom lived in Center County. She would have had to have been at least 18 months older to fit into this family. Through research on multiple historical sites and through both genealogy records as well as grave sites, there are absolutely no records of another sister to Margaret or daughter by Rosanna or heir to the Brown Estates. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage, and I hope you enjoy hearing this story of a man and his willingness to do anything for money. If you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. And please take a moment to click subscribe for more of this journey through Odyssey stories of who we once were. It costs you nothing but a click and will give you continuous adventures in return. Although William Brown was the owner of a farm, he actually worked as a carpenter at the Matilda Furnace just on the other side of the Juniata River from Mount Union. His farm was worked by hired help, including Robert McConaughey, for a share of the harvested crops and a cabin on the farm about 100 yards from the Brown's main cabin. Robert McConaughey allegedly spoke often about obtaining great wealth and having land of his own. Apparently, as the story goes, he was so consumed by this need that he plotted a method in which to obtain this wealth through nefarious means. He chose the date to execute his plan, Saturday, May 30th. It was simple. He needed to create a situation that called William Brown home early from the Matilda Furnace, required John to come up from Shirleysburg Farm and get all the members of the family at the cabin. Why Saturday? It was the only day of the week where William Brown would be home with the family. So he needed to create a situation that would bring John up from Shirleysburg. Robert knew John had been eyeing up a colt on the farm ever since it was a foal. He was able to get John to come on Saturday by visiting him on Friday and telling him that his father was ready to sell him the colt. Robert told John that it had to be on Saturday because his father would be back at the furnace on Sunday. On Saturday morning, Robert woke his wife and children early in the morning and took them to his mother's home several miles away. The reason is stated that he did not want them to see what was to occur. Of the Browns, little George, Jacob, and David were out playing in the fields in the woods, like normal kids in these parts do. Betsy was helping her mother bake in the kitchen. Robert McConaughey set out to execute his plan. George was found playing near the woods at the end of the farm field. Robert had him come a little further into the woods where he then began to beat George with the supple of a grain thrashing flail. George's jaw and skull were crushed and his right arm in self-defense was broken in multiple locations. But Robert finished killing George by choking him to death with his bare hands. When George's body was finally found, some animal had eaten the flesh from his head. 
David was found and persuaded into the woods where George's body was located. Robert strangled him to death. When David's body was found, his face was black and his tongue swollen and protruding. Robert then found Jacob on the other side of the farm and told him that his brothers were out gunning in the next field. As Robert led Jacob along, Jacob ran ahead to join his brothers, and at that time, Robert fired a bullet through his head from behind. He took the dead body and he covered it with old leaves and sticks. Although the shot would have been heard by everyone for miles and miles around, the sound of gunfire from hunting and target practice was an extremely common sound, much as it is today in these parts. Robert went to the Brown's cabin and spoke with Betsy. He told her he had found a strawberry patch and wanted her to come with him to help gather them. Betsy picked up a bucket and walked off with Robert to this alleged patch. Robert took Betsy to the same location as Jacob's body. He then picked up a stone and began bashing in her head. When she fell to the ground, he put his foot on her throat and stood on it until he was sure she was dead. And like Jacob, he covered her with leaves and sticks. At this point, McConaughey went to the barn and waited for Rosanna Brown to come to the door of the cabin. Before long, Rosanna came to the door and Robert took a shot. The bullet hit, only hit her in the arm and Robert rushed into the cabin to help her and asked if she knew who shot her. And Rosanna said she did not. Robert gave her a drink of water and told her to go lie down in her bed. He then grabbed an ax and struck her above the right eye, fracturing her skull and knocking her over onto the bed. Rosanna's throat was then cut from ear to ear with the ax and her body was covered with a quilt. Robert went on to rob the Browns of their money, locked in a chest on top of a clock along with lead bullets, percussion caps, and tobacco. He hid these items within a jar inside the barn. He then washed the axe, closed and locked all the windows, shut the door, and removed the door handle so it couldn't be opened. Going back to his house, he washed the blood from his hands and changed his clothes and returned to the barn. After a wait, John appeared. He was unable to go into the house because the door handle was missing. Robert fired at John with his gun, striking John in the chest with a bullet that passed clean through his body and into the front door of the cabin. John started to run, climbed the fence that was around the cabin, and as he approached the barn, fell over dead. Robert then dragged John's large, heavy body into the cabin and pushed him partly under the bed of his mother's corpse. Robert searched John's body and took the $10 he had brought to buy the colt from his father. He then took the horse down to the barn and patiently waited for William, his father-in-law. William, carrying a skillet and sledgehammer over his shoulder, arrived at the cabin in the late afternoon. He stepped up to the door of the cabin, but could not get in because the door handle was missing. As he turned to look around, Robert took the shot. The shot missed and glanced off the griddle and into the door. William had seen the flash of the muzzle come from the barn. Robert fired a second shot and this one cut through William's cheek and took off the lower part of his ear. As the smoke cleared, William saw someone looking at him from the barn. He recognized it to be Robert McConaughey, and according to the records, stated, You damned rascal! What are you doing there? William Brown ran to the rear of the barn, but saw no one. He searched the barn and found the door handles and his two rifles. William went back to the cabin with the door handles and rifles, entered the cabin and went to retrieve some lead, but there was none there. William Brown 
ran out of the cabin and met up with Lewis brothers, John Rinker, John Taylor, and William Atherton, whom were all working the orchard up the road. He told them the story of being shot and finding his son John's body under the bed. William assumed the rest of his family had all run away. When he went back to the cabin, John Taylor went with him to help look around the property. While in the cabin, Taylor noticed blood on the headboard of the bed and stated, Do you think there's somebody in the bed? William pulled the quilt away and found his wife's mutilated body. He then fell to his knees and broke into tears, exclaiming, What have I done to have my family killed off so? Locals started to gather, and a justice of the peace named Randall Alexander came in order to organize an inquest or a judicial inquiry to ascertain facts relating to this incident. William Brown was the first suspect and was believed to have inflicted the gunshot to his face to remove suspicion. The children at this time had not been found. William was held in county jail overnight but testimony of people who had seen him walking home from Matilda Furness gave cause for an immediate release. The night of the murders, McConaughey had appeared at 7 p.m. on the east side of Clear Ridge in Harris Valley. He seemed to be in a big hurry and he was wearing a clean shirt with his sleeves rolled up to his elbows and whistling. He spent the night at his mother's house. After a few days, the inquest called upon the McConaughey's. Robert's only alibi was that he was in Hare's Valley looking for a house. He could not give the names of anyone he had met or saw and claimed his wife wanted to move out due to fear of her father. Robert had changed his story several times during the inquest. A physician was brought in to examine Robert's hands, which still had blood under the fingernails. Let me know in the comments below if you know of stories and locations such as this one of the Brown family murder. My research is limited only by the information that people do not share openly. Help me break that barrier and let's share the history and culture of who we once were. Robert McConaughey was taken to county and held until trial in August. The quick verdict of guilt was brought to light as it showed McConaughey was the only person with motive, had sought, created, and possessed the opportunity to commit the crime, had premeditated his crime, gave no reasonable account of his whereabouts, and that no other person could have committed it. His fingers bore the unmistakable evidence of his guilt. Robert McConaughey was found guilty of murder in the first degree of the six members of the Brown family. He believed he couldn't be hanged unless he fully confessed. The final sentencing for Robert was death by gallows. On November 6, 1840, the day of his execution, Robert McConaughey asked to speak with clergy and have them pray for him. When the service of the clergy was concluded on the scaffold of the gallows and the drop fell, the rope broke and Robert McConaughey landed on his feet and fell backward. With a renewed hope of living another day, he exclaimed that he ought to be freed by this intervention of God. The sheriff walked Robert McConaughey back to the scaffold. The rope was doubled. Realizing the hanging was actually going to happen and be a reality, Robert made a complete confession of the crimes before the ministers. And at one half minute past 3 p.m., Robert McConaughey was dropped and hanged until dead. Robert McConaughey was the first man ever hanged in Huntington County. After finding all of the bodies, the Browns were buried by the locals in a mass grave by the cabin on the farm, where this dedication marker is all that's left. This story is a true and factual part of the history of Huntington County. 
some more odd aspects to the story are that of the fact that you cannot find Robert McConaughey's gravesite on findagrave.com. And no, this is not an advertisement for that promotion or for that site or a promotion, but his name does not appear as a spouse to Margaret Brown McConaughey or any of their two or five children. Two or five children. Well, that's another odd thing. Margaret Brown McConaughey had two children born before February 1841, which would be nine months after the time Margaret would have seen her husband, Robert McConaughey. But she has three children born after 1841 whom bear the name McConaughey, and another three whom bear the name Price. In both situations of all the children, there is no sight nor record of their fathers. Perhaps Robert McConaughey had a brother or brothers who stepped in as daddy, but were equally put down by the state authorities, for there's no death records or grave sites recording their internment. Subsequently, there was a man in the area by the name of Price who matches the dates of the children's births and was also hanged in Cambria County for crimes he had committed. This is just speculation, but perhaps Margaret was just as bad and knew all along what Robert was doing, maybe even masterminding it, a black widow. But we'll never know, and the man who committed the crime of the century paid the price for his actions. 